let us now talk about investing in non-domestic equities and this essentially means investing in stocks of companies that are outside our uh, home market or outside our domestic market first let's go over a few basic definitions what are integrated markets integrated markets are markets where capital can flow easily between two markets so for example if you take the uh, if you take the eurozone market so the different countries within the eurozone countries like germany spain france etc so this would be an example of a very well integrated market because money flows very easily across these across these different countries then if you take the eurozone and uh, the usa there again these markets are reasonably well integrated because money flows relatively easily across institutions in europe and the united states and to take another extreme if you take the india and pakistan economies this is not well integrated because money does not flow easily between these two countries so these two countries or these two markets the the indian financial market and the pakistani financial market are not well integrated another term that you should know is that of direct investing direct investing is where an investor directly purchases shares in uh, another country so as an example if you have a institutional investor in the us such as goldman sachs and if they directly buy shares of japanese airlines in, in on the on the tokyo stock exchange that would be an example of direct investing now this direct investing is not uh, not easily available to all investors so for example if somebody sitting in pakistan wants to directly buy shares in india that will not be possible so direct investing you need to understand the concept generally it works for institutional investors across reasonably well integrated markets from an exam perspective you need to understand what a uh, depository receipt means and then there are other terms that are subsets of a uh, depository receipt so essentially a uh, depository receipt allows investors to invest in or indirectly invest in uh, markets other than their home market the idea is straightforward we within within depository receipts essentially what happens is we have an institution called a depository bank and let's take a simple example let's say that we have a organization like mcb which is a pakistani bank if a bank such as deutsche bank buys shares of mcb and then against those shares of mcb they can then issue what's called depository receipts in the london stock exchange so when a investor now buys these depository receipts in the london stock exchange he is essentially getting exposure to uh, to mcb if mcb shares go up the investor in the mcb depository receipts will benefit if the mcb share price goes down then the value of this depository receipt goes down these depository receipts are generally denominated in dollars so in addition to the value of mcb shares another important variable is the rupee dollar exchange rate so if the rupee appreciates relative to the dollar then the investor over here who has bought mcb uh, depository receipts in dollars he will benefit if the rupee strengthens against the dollar it's important to understand within the context of depository receipts that you can have what's called sponsored depository receipts and unsponsored depository receipts sponsored depository receipts means that the sponsor in this case mcb is involved in the process and unsponsored depository receipts are where the sponsor mcb in this case uh, 
would not be involved. So for an unsponsored depository receipt, it's straightforward. There, the investment bank or the depository bank actually will simply buy these shares and issue depository receipts. So they will simply be buying existing shares of MCB and MCB is not involved in the process. For a sponsored depository release, uh, for a sponsored depository receipt, the the sponsor would be involved and potentially would be issuing new shares uh, and hence raising capital using depository receipts another categorization for depository receipts is gdr versus adr and this is a simple uh, classification gdr stands for global depository receipts and adr stands for american depository receipts if you have a depository receipt in the United States, then that's called uh, ADR. So, for example, if uh, if an uh, investor wants to buy Japanese Airlines shares in the US, he buys them through what's called a Japanese Airlines ADR. Outside the US, in markets such as London and Luxembourg, we call a uh, GDR a uh, global depository receipt actually in simplistic terms a global depository receipt simply represents uh, ownership of a share which is which belongs to a company outside your home market i will talk about adrs in a little more detail on the next slide just two more terms that you need to be aware of one is GRS and the other is BLDR GRS stands for global registered shares and these are simply shares which are traded in different currencies on stock exchanges around the world and then we have BLDR which stands for basket of listed depository receipts and these are essentially an exchange traded fund which are a collection of depository receipts so now let's talk about different types of american depository receipts there are four types of adrs level one level two level three and unlisted or rule 144a adrs level one adrs are the simplest kind the objective with these is simply to broaden the US uh, broaden the investor base or essentially including US investors in your investor base with these ADRs all that is happening is a depository bank is buying shares of say Japanese Airlines in the in the Japanese market and issuing ADRs against those shares in the US market hence with a level 1 ADR we do not raise any money on the US markets SEC registration is required the trading is in over the counter markets what this essentially means is that we have large institutions involved in these ADRs these institutions buy and sell the ADRs with uh, buy and sell ADRs with each other the ADRs are not traded on a exchange such as the New York Stock Exchange the listing fees for this situation are low and the size and earnings requirements do not exist so you can have a level 1 ADR for even small companies with a level 2 ADR again the objective is to broaden the investor base so as to include investors in the US here again we do not raise capital in the US market through a level 2 ADR SEC registration is required but trading now includes the major stock exchanges such as the New York Stock Exchange and nasdaq listing fees are high because we are listing on the major stock exchanges and size size and earnings requirements do exist so a company needs to meet a certain threshold in terms of size and earnings in order to go for a level 2 adr and hence to be listed on a major exchange
Level 3 ADR is the most complex. Here the objectives are twofold. One, to broaden the investor base and two, to also raise capital. So here the company is actually raising capital by issuing new shares as ADR. So actually new shares are, are created or issued by the company and ADRs are created against those newly issued shares and hence this is a mechanism of raising capital. SEC registration is obviously required and these shares actually would trade again on major exchanges such as the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ listing fees as you can imagine are high and clearly there are size and earnings requirements. So with rule 144a essentially what happens is a company can raise money so let's say that uh, a company in Pakistan wants to raise funds using using this sort of ADR they can simply approach uh, interested entities or interested financial institutions in the US and raise money from those institutions and and essentially give a percentage of the company to those institutions so the objective here is uh, is to raise capital and this is actually capital only from qualified institutions so raising capital is a uh, yes SEC registration is not required there is uh, there is no real trading that happens over here the listing fees are as you can imagine very low and size and earnings requirements do not really exist Now changing gears slightly, let's talk about the risk and return of equities. Briefly on return, when you invest in equities, there are three types of return that you can get. One is capital gains. So if you buy a stock for 50 and it goes to 60 after one year, this is referred to as capital gains. Dividends is the dividend that you get. So let's say on this stock, you got a $2 dividend. So that represents your dividend yield. Foreign exchange gain happens when you invest in shares outside your country. So if you invest in, uh, let's say, shares in the United States and the dollar strengthens against the rupee, then that gain is referred to as a foreign exchange gain. If you are in India or Pakistan, then you are thinking in terms of rupees. And obviously, if the dollar strengthens, then from a rupee perspective you have uh, you are better off because your asset in this example is in dollars obviously when you invest in your own home currency in your in, in your own country and in your currency then this this component of return does not exist a core theme in finance that you will see over and over is when you take higher risk you should uh, as in when when investors take higher risk investors expect a higher return so when you compare these different kinds of investments within the within the equities uh, asset class we need to see what the relative risks are and then based on that we can set expectations about returns so when we compare common shares with preference shares Common shares represent a residual interest, which means that common shareholders get paid only after preference shareholders get paid a return. So common shares have a higher risk. So the risk is higher for common shares and hence the expected return should be higher for common shares relative to preference shares. Within the preference shares category, we have cumulative as well as non-cumulative preference shares. And as described earlier, cumulative preference shares are those where if in a given year dividends are not paid out, they accumulate and are paid subsequently before common shareholders get any money. And clearly that means that cumulative preference shares are less risky than non-cumulative and therefore 
non an investor should expect a higher return on non cumulative preference shares callable versus non callable shares from a uh, investor perspective the callable shares are more risky because the company or the issuer has the right to call these shares back at a given price since these are more risky from an investor perspective he should expect a higher return on on callable shares puttable versus non puttable shares again as a quick recap with a puttable share an investor has the right to give the share back to the issuer and get a predefined amount of money for it so the relative risk is is low with puttable shares relative to non puttable shares and hence since the since the risk is higher over here the expected return should also be higher with non puttable shares equity securities and company value so some very basic points here companies issue equity to raise capital and increase liquidity so if you have a company that wants to expand one way that it can raise money is by issuing new shares and essentially bringing on new shareholders when the company issues new shares it gets cash and hence the liquidity goes up typically companies issue equity to finance revenue generating activities so property plant equipment etc is often purchased using equity capital and what that essentially means is that typically companies do not issue equity for working capital obviously this is a, a this is not a hard and fast rule so we are simply saying that in general companies use equity money to fund or finance revenue generating activities now the equity itself becomes a sort of a currency for the for the issuer because the equity itself can at times be used for acquisitions so at times you might hear that xyz company used its shares to buy a 60% stake in uh, another company so essentially what happens there is a company uses its shares so a company gives its shares to the shareholders of another company in return for a certain percentage of that other company so not a hugely important point at level 1 but uh, all you need to know is the the shares of a company itself provide the company with a currency that is often used for acquisitions through equity equities equities also allow companies to do option based incentives for employees so what this essentially means is that a company can for example tell, it, tell its senior uh, offer stock options to its senior management encouraging them to do a good job and when employees come back to exercise those options the company issues shares and gives those shares to the employee obviously there is a certain exercise price that the employee needs to pay but nevertheless new shares have to be issued we talk about stock options in more details at uh, in other places in the curriculum now a larger point that needs to be made here is that management goal is to increase book value and maximize market value of equity so this point i hope you already know but just to reemphasize the distinction between book value or market value the book value of a company is is based on the assets and liabilities so as you probably know on for a given company we have assets we have liabilities and we have equity and the total value of assets let's say is 100 if the value of liabilities is 70 then the book value the book value of equity is simply assets minus liabilities which is 30 and this book value will be reported on a given date so on a given date we look at the book value of assets the book value of liabilities and then the book value of the company is simply the value of assets minus the value of liabilities 
and this typically will change from change over the course of the year we will have this number at the beginning of the year and then this number at the end of the year and to get the average book value during the year an investor will typically take the average of the beginning year book value and the ending year book value now how does a why does a company management directly influence book value or essentially if management uh, management for example can uh, can increase the value uh, can can influence book value in a few different ways one obvious way is if new shares are issued then that obviously will increase assets by raising cash and that will also increase equity uh, management might do other actions that influence net income which essentially influences earnings market value is the value of the company in the in the stock market so market value is essentially how much a uh, uh, investor is willing to pay for this company now if this company has very bright prospects then a uh, investor might be willing to pay let's say 45 million for this company so the company has a book value of 30 but an investor is willing to pay 45 million so the better that a company management is doing or the rosier the prospects of that company the higher the market value for a publicly listed company the market value will simply be the number of shares outstanding times the share price so very simplistically put if the book value is going up market value goes up but more importantly market value is a function of what investors expect this company to do in the future and since since the market value is determined by what investors think about the company management has a indirect impact on market value so if if the management can convince the market that they are doing a good job and the company has bright prospects then market value will go up on the other hand if the market does not have a high opinion of the company or what the management is doing then the market value will come down and at this stage i would strongly encourage you to look at exhibit 22 in the curriculum which is on page 193 so this is a short reading but this is what warren buffett says about book value and market value and any investor should should know about warren buffett he is arguably one of the greatest investors of all times and when you when you read this exhibit it will just take you 5 minutes but i think it is a excellent read so please go ahead and and study that now let's talk about accounting return on equity this is a straightforward concept let's say that we are looking at the accounting return on equity for the year 2010 for company x now there are two ways to come up with the accounting return on equity the simple formula for return on equity is the net income in a given year so here let's say the year is 2010 divided by the average book value for 2010 and the way we find the book the net income for 2010 is simply the net income generated in 2010 the average book value is simply the book value at the start of the year book value at the end of the year and you take their average so this thing this denominator simply becomes book value start plus book value at the end of the year divided by 2 so this is one method of coming up with the return on equity and the good thing about this measure is that it's fairly objective so you can look at the income statement for 2010 and come up with your net income you can look at your balance sheet for 2009 and the ending balance sheet so the balance sheet for 31st december 2009 will give you the book value at the start of 2010 your balance sheet for 2010 so 31st december 2010 will give you the book value at the end of 2010 you take an average of the of those two numbers and that gives you the average book value of the year 
sometimes you might want to see what was your return relative to equity at the start of the year so there then the the ROE will simply be equal to the net income for 2010 divided by the book value at the start of 2010 so you will see both these methods used and depending on the context you can figure out what makes more sense now a question to ask is whether it is good if return on equity is going up and the answer is that it depends you need to see why is return on equity going up so let's look at the formula again so formula is net income divided by book value if you have a situation where return on equity is going up because net income is going up very fast relative to book value that in general is a positive sign so in that case it is good that ROE is going up but another reason that ROE might be going up is that let's say net income is flat but book value of a company for whatever reason is going down so in this situation the ROE is going up but it's not a very positive sign and uh, something else that you have studied both in corporate finance as well as in financial reporting and analysis is the DuPont analysis which allows you to decompose ROE and since we've already done that twice I will not repeat it here from an exam perspective it's important to be able to calculate return on equity now why do we do accounting return on equity versus uh, market value calculations the accounting return on equity is very objective and simple to do so 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 one should do this but another caution when one does accounting return on equity is if you are using this ratio to compare two companies let's say a and b you need to make sure that you are that both companies are using the same accounting standards and if they are not then you need to adjust the numbers so as to so as to bring them on the same level so if one company is using IFRS and another is using US GAAP you need to use similar assumptions for both companies or similar accounting related assumptions in order to come up with a ROE that can be compared and we talked about this concept in a lot of detail in FRA so I won't spend too much time over here in terms of market value as I said earlier that is much more subjective so market value is uh, you must calculate it as you will as you will see in Warren Buffett's little note but uh, the value that you come up with uh, here is much more subjective and based on a lot of assumptions now let's talk about required return and cost of equity the cost of equity is the minimum expected rate of return that a company must offer its investors to purchase its shares so when a company is offering shares investors will buy those shares if they get at least a certain amount of return now what's that certain amount of return that certain amount of return is based on how much risk the investors think they are taking and this cost of equity is often denoted by the symbol RE which is the cost of equity and we discussed this in corporate finance when we were talking about cost of capital where equity is one form of capital and the cost of that form of capital is referred to as RE so if the expected rate of return let's say that when shares are issued the expected rate of return is 12 percent and if this rate of return is not maintained then the share price will fall so when the share price falls then automatically the the return goes up because if you are expecting a certain dividend stream and let's say that that dividend stream does not happen so investors are expecting that on a per year basis they will get let's say to make it very simple investors are expecting dividends of one dollar one dollar one dollar and based on this uh, this uh, expected dividend stream the there is a price of let's say uh, let's say that based on this there is a price of uh, dollars n now 
if instead of getting one dollar it now appears that the amount that will be received is 0.9 dollars or 90 cents then clearly this share price is going to fall and we will see this in a little more detail in a subsequent reading but the general idea is if a price is determined given certain expectations if those expectations return expectations are not met then the price of the share will fall another important point is how do we calculate the cost of equity the re and you've seen this before broadly speaking two models are used very often one is called the dividend discount model and the other is capm at least in level one these are the two most important models in subsequent levels there will be other more advanced models that you look at but the dividend discount model there i'll remind you of the formula so let's do that here the cost of equity is equal to d1 divided by price plus g so this is the current price d1 is the expected dividend in one year's time and g is the growth rate of dividends so this obviously assumes that we will have a certain growth rate so we make an assumption about the growth rate and we make an assumption about what the expected next dividend is in one year's time so this is the formula for re using the dividend discount model clearly this only works in situations where we have a, a very predictable and reasonable dividend another model is capm where the cost of equity using capm is equal to the risk free rate plus beta which represents the systematic risk of the stock times the market risk premium which is the expected return on market minus the risk free rate and you've seen these a couple of times already so i hope that this is just a simple refresher so that brings us to the end of this reading please uh, practice as i keep telling you to do so and you will see some good practice questions in the curriculum here in fact the curriculum has about 24 questions which you must do and then do the questions from your study notes if you like this video please press on the like button